welcome to See What She Can Do Conversations, the podcast. I'm Tina Pinelli, and I am here with my co-host, Gina Borger. Hello, I'm Gina. Gina is our communications intern, and this is her very first podcast, and we're super excited to have her rock this show. So um, thanks for joining us, Gina. We also have guests, Emily and Judy Renberg. They are our mother-daughter duo. And um, we're going to talk today about how when women support women, we can do awesome things in our world. Uh, Most importantly, we can make it a kinder, more inclusive place. Emily is uh, an awesome superstar. We've been working with her through See What She Can Do over the last year. She is an active advocate for inclusivity in sport and gender equity. Um, She is a competitive player. She played ringette for 15 years. Um, She's hosted live broadcasts. Um, And we want to hear all about that. It's super exciting. And she also has her own podcast called Even Strength. So welcome to the show, Emily. Thank you for having me, Tina and Gina. Really excited to be here today. And Judy comes to us today from Calgary. We're super excited to have uh, Judy join us from the other side of Canada. And she is also a ringette player. She's played since she was 10 years old. So she's played a little longer than uh, Emily has. <laughs> um, <laughs> we are uh, we are mamas. We are both mamas on this side. And we've got all generations of people on this call. So it's super exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, and Judy is also deeply involved in the ringette community. We're going to talk a little bit about her leadership there and the kinds of changes she's seen in this really awesome community. Um, and we also know that Judy is a number one cheerleader for Emily in her lifelong pursuit of, of um, sport, but also just an active life. So we're grateful for the impact that moms um, have on their daughters and daughters have on their moms. Um, so we're going to explore that a bit more today, too. So welcome to the show, Judy. Thank you so much. Excited to be here. Awesome. Well, let's jump right in. Okay, Gina, over to you. Yes. So to start, um, I'd like to ask you, Emily, uh, what fueled this passion for sport and community? Well, Gina, I think part of the reason that I'm still very, very involved in sport is because I've had a connection to it for so long, and it's become uh, a really critical part of the way that I see myself and the way that I interact with my community. Um, I've been playing ringette, like Tina said, for 15 years Mm -hmm. and uh, taking a couple of years break on and off uh, in between there. So I'm still very involved in that community. And I think because um, I love it so much, I want to carry it in different ways. And so that's had a huge impact on my life in, you know, sports related things, career related things, school related things, you name it. And it brings me so much joy. So I love to, you know, still be involved and, and use my my skills in this in the communities and do what i can to increase sport uh, increase sports involvement for everybody absolutely i love that um so obviously you've mentioned this ringette's been been a huge part of your life um so what has the impact of ringette of sport i mean in general uh had on your life your career like where you are right now So I've been a player for for many, many years, and I've been to three national championships. I was on Team Alberta twice. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of great things within the sport as a player itself, and that brought me a lot of opportunity to meet new people and travel places across the country and really feel that kind of success. But for me, I think Ringette has really given me a lot of skills outside of that as well. And um, Tina, you mentioned that I did broadcasting. And... um, when I took a break from Ringette, I still wanted to be involved with sports, but I wanted to do it in a different role. So I found sports broadcasting um, at Radio Western. So I did varsity hockey. I did lots of articles for other sports, but live commentary was varsity hockey. And I thought that was a really great way to, you know, still maintain my involvement within the sport community, but try something new. Nice. So you've done broadcasting. Um, and I remember... I think you mentioned that the broadcast team that you were on was the first female-led one, right? Which I think that is something. Yes. That is something to point out. I think that's incredible. What was it like being a part of that? So, yeah, great question. Um, So it is true. I was on the all-women's broadcast. It was 
2019, January 2019. And what was special about that, and not a lot of people know this, because I think um, not a lot of people just know this in general, is that the entire broadcast was done by women. So everybody that you heard, obviously, was women, but it was also produced by women. Nice. The social media was done by women, all the photography, everything in the background was also run by women. So there had been broadcasts with on-air talent prior to us being all women, but there had never been something like we'd done where every single person um, identified as a woman, wow. which was super special for us because it was, again, a huge, a huge moment in, in broadcast history, in sports. Um, and we even had Caroline, who is the co-founder with Tina, um, with See What She Can Do, show up to that uh, game that we did the broadcast for. It was for um, Western women's varsity hockey. And um, it was a really, And that was really pretty cool hard day. because she's a Queen's graduate, eh? So I had to like, <laughs> put my purple Western stuff on her head and say, come on, go on. Yeah, anyways, I'm teasing. She had a great time. <laughs> we had to drag her into the ring. No, she was awesome. She took photos and, and did articles for us and, and really got the uh, excitement up around us because I like even with this conversation happening, obviously we're talking about women helping each other. That's a really, really great example of that because, you know, if we're doing something, um, there's obviously an impact. But if other people know that we're doing these things, there's even more of an impact. So having that community and being able to do that, was it was just a, so, a super cool experience because um, you just felt like you were creating a space for somebody doesn't matter who it was but you just felt like you were creating a space for somebody mm -hmm. but also just really exciting as an individual and being like I'm making something here I love that well and hats off to Radio Western for opening those doors and providing that opportunity yeah. and you know we're talking about women supporting women but this is really all of us supporting each other too right and that's a prime example of how mm -hmm. you know they uh, gave you the opportunity to be out there and represent it and it was pretty exciting for us actually to even even cover that story because you know what we see there is you're taking steps that haven't been taken before so you're opening doors for others yeah. um, and showing people that they can do it and that there is an opportunity and we've seen you know people come out of um, actually Radio Western <laughs> you've seen people go on to you know host um, you know NHL um, conversations you know so we've, we've got professionals that come out of the universities in those programs or in those communities um, for their professional lives so it's awesome that you were able to demonstrate to people that um, it's possible um, and I'm wondering if there are others in your life from a mentor standpoint that have maybe shown you where things are possible that you may not have even considered before so any kind of mentors in your life that that have made an impact on you, Emily? Well, Tina, I think to answer that question, um, maybe perhaps the, the definition of mentor kind of confines my answers because I don't think I necessarily have someone who's like a formal mentor who took me through processes, who said, here's what you can achieve, here's what I did, let's work together. But because I've been so involved in sports, specifically ringette, um, which is mostly women, um, I've had a lot of really great people help me get to where I am today in terms of coaching, in terms of competition, in terms of other athletes, um, administrators, like everybody top to bottom is all working towards a common goal. And I think that had a really big impact. And I honestly, I'll bring it over to my mom. Um, she's yeah. on the administrative yeah. side now. <laughs> she's on the admin side, which she used to coach me for many, many years. I think it was up to, maybe, I think it was maybe nine or 10. And after that, she decided 13. to get into 13, 13. <laughs> and so she decided to get into admin. I'm sure she can tell you this story. But for me, um, because she was no longer um, coaching me, but she still had her own team to play for, um, seeing her move into like an administrative role and work um, with volunteering and be on boards and be presidents and do all of this stuff administratively, it kind of opened up my eyes to seeing other opportunities that were not just limited to being a player in sports. So that was a big key thing for me just to see that and understand, okay, well, sports need to run somehow, not just players. Somebody has to do that. And there are other options yeah. to, to sports than just being a player. Somebody has to do the bottle drive. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> is, it is true. But you have done far more than bottle drive, Judy. <laughs> I mean, you've run the largest, the ESO Golden Ring tournament mm -hmm. is the largest mm -hmm. ringette tournament is it in north america is it 
the world. In, it's a in the big world, term, right? actually. Yeah, in, in the world. world. Yeah. yeah. So you 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 are very humble because it is more than just the bottle drive. <laughs> You've had big <laughs> impacts on that sport. I, I'm interested in hearing. I mean, we know the research shows that when moms are active, like their kids are way more likely to be active. I think the number is like 70% of women who are active, their kids are active, right? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. now, and, and the other piece we often hear when we're out covering events, we haven't done a lot of event coverage these days because a lot of stuff has been shut down. But yeah. what we hear when we're typically out there is the impact of you know, daughters or children on their parents as well. What kind of impact has kind of Emily being active had on your life, Judy? Well, honestly, anything that Emily has wanted to do her entire life is what she has gone out to achieve. She's never been shy. (laughs) She's usually the first person with her hand in the air to volunteer or demonstrate. So I've always found her confidence inspiring, honestly. Um, She's a great uh, leader. And so it's, it, it's easy to kind of get caught up in her energy and, uh, and, and you see the group does the same and they all kind of uh, build off of each other. And that's just one of the great aspects of team sport. I, I mean, not to say anything against individual sport because uh, there's great benefits to that as mm-hmm. well, but there's a uniqueness to a team sport um, that kind of translates to real life. And I think that shows in what Emily has achieved today um, she's still very confident, still very much a leader. And, uh, and so I just actually am continue to be inspired by her. And when she texts me or calls me and says, oh, I have some exciting news, I'm never shocked because there's always something new and exciting going on with Emily that, uh, that just doesn't, uh, surprise me anymore. <laughs> she's just, uh, so capable. So, yeah. yeah. Amazing. Yay. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> I was going to say, um, that, that's so beautiful to see how, just to hear you even speak about how she has inspired and, you know, impacted your life. I think often you're right, Tina, it's easy to like, we often just look at it the other way, but I think it's beautiful to see the, mm-hmm. you know, the younger generations, how we have, you know, made a difference in our parents' lives. I think it's really beautiful and inspiring. Um, and I agree. I mean, I don't, I have had just few opportunities to meet Emily and to just talk to you, listen to your podcast. Um, but I feel like even in just listening to you, reading articles about you, you know, even that one conversation we had, I feel like I feel that energy and I feel that confidence, um, mm-hmm. which I think is beautiful. Um, and just shows that it's something that is very much effortless and that very much comes naturally to you. Um, you don't have to be like, hey, this is, you know, I'm confident, I'm Emily. It's just like, it, exu- it exudes from, you know, from just the way you speak, um, the way you articulate yourself. So I agree. Um, <laughs> um, so moving on to, you've done a lot. We've talked about that, you know, you you have a podcast, which I think is incredible. Um, and I kind of want to touch a bit on how sport has helped build, you know, these skills, this confidence uh, to be an entrepreneur, to, you know, try new things, to um, has uh, even was sport the thing that or have you always been this way? Kind of touch a little on that. So for me, I think it's it's two points. Um, the podcast really came out of me still wanting to be connected to the sports world um, during COVID. I started it in May of 2020. And it also started because um, of my experiences in sport and recognizing that there is, at this current moment, especially in North America, there's no such thing as really sports equality. We can say there is, but I mean, in, in real life, in real practice, you talk to individuals, there, there typically isn't. Um, so I think to answer your question, Gina, sport has given me a lot of really great things in life in terms of skills. Um, being good at something does help boost your confidence. So, you know, if, yeah. if I was good at ringette, I, I felt good and I felt confident. Um, you can translate that confidence into, into other things and be like, okay, well, I'm good at something. Maybe I can be good at another thing. Um, in terms of, of skills to become a podcaster, I think 
sports just kind of allowed me to navigate this space naturally because it is a sports podcast and I didn't feel like I had to really, really stretch outside of my comfort zone in that respect to get people to interview, to speak to them about sports and ask them about their sports. Um, Because my coverage goes from, I mean, I did uh, auto racing to skateboarding to concussions to rock climbing. Like, I didn't feel like I needed to really go out of my comfort zone to have a a good foundation in that knowledge to ask people questions. Um, But I think the biggest thing for me with the podcast is I just felt like I wanted to create something in the sports space using my knowledge, using my my ability to put something together and put it out to the world and my network and give people the platform that is not being given to them at this current moment. Absolutely. I think that's very beautiful. Now I was going to ask about your confidence because I do think, um, you know, even the most confident people have barriers and things they need to overcome, whether it's, you know, the little voice in the back of your head say, you know, come on, you really can't do it or something that makes you nervous um, but you step forward anyways. Have you had a moment in your life where you're like, oh, I don't know, um, but you were able to kind of, and, and how did you talk yourself into doing going for it anyways? Because clearly you go for it, right? But there must be, with every new thing, There is there something sometimes that says, uh, like how do you evaluate that situation and get yourself through it? So I've had lots of examples of this, um, but I think... I try not to show that, and maybe that's why people think I have so much confidence. But one of the best examples of that I can think of, at least recently, was when I did my first play-by-play call for Radio Western. And what what they manage to do with their broadcasters is they'll put you as a sideline reporter, and you'll do intermissions, and you'll talk to people halfway through periods, and you just have your little mic, and you run around the rink and try to find people to talk to. So the pressure isn't really on you. You're kind of like a, a entertainment piece for when the the two main people aren't speaking then they saw how quickly i picked up on that and moved me to color commentary so filling in the blanks for the play-by-play of the of the hockey game so as the play is being described if there's some some lull in the conversation then i bring up some stats and, and kind of paint a picture of what's going on on the ice because it's radio and people really can't see it so there is a certain uh picture painting for that but when they said oh emily we'd like you to do play by play that was a little bit scary for me because that involved a lot more effort, a lot more knowledge, a lot more um, skill that I wasn't sure that I had because you literally watch the ice in front of you and you call out who has the puck in the split second that they have that puck and what they do with that puck and where the puck is and who takes it from who and who gets a penalty and whose number is... And you really don't know the people who you're calling because it's varsity hockey and there's always tons of different teams and you don't follow it as much as you do maybe with your favorite NHL team and who they play against. But that and you're not day, getting fed content, right? Like it's, it's no. like you're having to do it yourself. It's yeah, awesome. that's another thing. With local radio as a volunteer, you do all of your prep, which does take hours of looking through stats and downloading rosters every single game that you cover and like highlighting all the key info that you want to talk about over the three hours. So a lot of prep goes in. But the day that I did play-by-play, I was with my uh, color commentator, and we were talking back and forth as the game was about to start. I felt good. Um, We called out the goalies, the lineups. Then the puck drops, and I look at the play, and my mind goes completely blank, like (laughs) white. I have never had a moment in my life where I didn't have something in my head to say or something that was telling me to say something. But at that time, it's literally radio silence for probably about 25 seconds. Or maybe it was five and my brain just went, oh, my God, this is an eternity. <laughs> but I looked at the ice and I was like, ah. Uh, and I think there was dead silence for probably about 20 seconds. But then once my brain started kicking in and being like, okay, it's all good, just, just start talking. Once I got that flow in, yeah. the, the, the key to doing play-by-play is actually to have your brain just kind of be on the sidelines. Like you just let things happen and you don't think about it too hard and you just let it flow out of your mouth and you – make sure you check numbers and stuff. But once you kind of get into that flow, it comes a lot easier. So that was one of the most immediately scary things that happened to me. Um, But once I got into it, fine, it was good. And I did it again, and I did it again. And that definitely helped um, build up my my skills and my confidence in that specific area. Wow, 
That is amazing. Okay, we're going to take a quick break, commercial break, and when we come back, we want to probe a little bit more with Judy around what happened since she was 10 years old to right now <laughs> with her her ringette playing and how it's kind of led her into multiple different roles uh, within the world of sport, but also within her own life, whether it's career or motherhood or whatever that looks like. So we'll come right back and we're going to jump right in with Judy when we do get back. So we can just pause for a minute. We'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by Franchinelli Glusman Integrative Medicine. Are you feeling tired? I know I am. Sometimes overwhelmed and maybe even having trouble sleeping. Do you feel like you need a break? Well, Franchinelli Glusman Integrative Medicine has a team of all kinds of experts, naturopathic doctors, massage therapists, psychotherapists, and exercise therapists, and they're going to help you achieve your best mental, emotional, and physical health. This great team uncovers the underlying cause of your health concerns, and then they provide you with recommendations that activate your very own body's innate healing powers for optimum health and wellness. During these unprecedented times, this is needed now more than ever. Find Franchinelli Glusman Integrative Medicine at SeeWhatSheCanDo.com on our Athlete Advisor. Okay, and we are back with Emily and Judy Redbird. We are talking about the joys of sport and the impact it can have on our life, and also how when we help each other, we can make this world so much of a better place. Judy, we want to jump right in and talk to you a little bit about the impact of sport on your life. Um, we know that you started at a young age and um, you've held many roles um, in the world of ringette, but we'd like to talk a little bit about the impact of sport and how it, you know, why you chose to move into a leadership role and the sorts of changes you've seen happen over the years in that community. Sure. So, uh, yeah, I did start playing when I was 10. I got a flyer home from school. I tried all kinds of things like kids do, you know, dance and soccer and baseball, nothing stuck. So got the flyer, had a couple friends say, I want to try this. My parents are from Scotland. They had no idea what ringette was. So said, sure, <laughs> uh, okay, and started playing and loved it. It was immediately hooked and uh, played for quite a few years, officiated as well took some time off to focus on school and then came back to it when I was 20. Started officiating and playing again and then I rekindled that love and played right till I was pregnant with Emily, came right back came, and then had my second uh, child, had my son, same thing, came right back, um, but got involved in, uh, in volunteering at, at a local level. I, I just, uh, I was hesitant and it, it kind of ties into what Emily was saying, sometimes you need to just take those first couple steps and realize that it's not as scary as you thought it was going to be and that you actually are kind of good at it. And so that's what I did. And my role grew from coach of Emily's very first team, which uh, at that time, the youngest age division was called Bunnies. So her first team was the Dust Bunnies, <laughs> which is my favorite team name ever. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, all the way up to when she was 13 and then went on to uh, more elite teams. And, and I stepped back from there. But um, my role from there, because I was less involved as a coach, became more involved as an administrator. And today I am, uh, I wear several hats. I've done, I've chaired, like you said, the Essel Golden Ring uh, for four years. I was also the chair for the 2015 Western Canadian Ring at Championships in Calgary. That was a pretty big uh, undertaking. And then uh, currently I am the facilities administrator and league director for ringette calgary and i'm also the ice scheduler for both you ringette so really busy in a typical year this year's been a little bit different <laughs> not gonna lie um not as much to schedule when there's no sport happening no sport, right? yeah. yeah but it's allowed us to kind of um take a, a moment to take a breath yeah. and step back and look at why we do things and uh should we just continue to do things in the same way because we've always done it that way or is this the moment to pivot? Is this the time to say, uh, you know, I think we can make this better? And I, I think we've started to to crack that door and we, we have some ideas, we have some plans. There's some really exciting stuff coming down the line. We're, we're also kind of, um, we're learning that the, the world is a different place than it used to be back when I was 10. Uh, 
uh, playing with uh, sawed off hockey sticks and getting changed in the bathroom because the boys are in the dressing room. Um, and, and we're kind of, Bringette is, is, has been embraced as, as its own sport. Um, it was created for women. We're super proud of it. It's almost like we own this yeah. sport, even though we do welcome um, boys and, and, uh, and other non-binary identities. It's primarily female-centered sport. So uh, it's exciting to see um, the changes. And, uh, and even, um, I, I'm going to probably make myself sound very old here, but um, Emily got me into TikTok during shutdown. Wow, and that's impressive. Yeah, I know. And I'm seeing all the ringette TikToks out there. And I think, wow, it's just amazing to see that this sport isn't just here locally. Because we do have quite a strong community in Alberta and Calgary specifically. Yeah. But it's across Canada and, yeah. and nationally uh, and internationally. And it's uh, it, it kind of gives you a little warm spot in your heart that there's people out there that love it just as much as you do. So have you seen... Um you know, have you seen, I mean, you've obviously watched Ringette from the inside grow. I mean, I've, I've heard, I mean, pre-COVID, the numbers were the highest ever in terms of um, mm. registration for Ringette in Canada. Are mm -hmm. you, uh, have you seen much of a change in terms of the game itself or the community? Like, what oh, how yeah. are you seeing this sport evolve? It's actually, it's amazing. There is a couple of pivotal moments in the sport that really changed it. And that was when they brought in a couple of big rule changes. Number one being they brought in shot clocks, yeah. which are 30 seconds uh, to, to change possession or take a shot. We used to have some superstar players who could carry that ring for days and nothing would change on the ice. Uh, and then also the um, elimination, we used to have colored sticks that would relate to your position. And instead they play by zone and they put in uh, extra lines to to kind of uh, uh, designate that. Those are those good for newbies, by the way. Those extra lines, because yeah, <laughs> I tried my hand at it a couple of years ago, which I love. I love those lines. I'm like, yeah, lines I get. That's what those yeah. lines are on my my hockey ice for. Now I understand. Yeah, yeah. yeah they're well, you know, they're not actually called ring at lines, but most people call yeah. them ring at yeah. lines. So, yeah. but um, yeah, so those two things drastically changed the sport, made it faster. Um, you have to think ahead of the play um, because you have you can pass it ahead it's not like there's offsides like in hockey so it's passed yeah. from zone to zone and um, it is called the fastest game on ice not necessarily because we are the fastest skaters but because the game is so quick you, you, you are, are thinking... beautiful skaters I will say I can tell the ringette player <laughs> that are. comes on to play hockey instantly it's just beautiful skating and you're yeah. right it is it is a fast game I love it I mean honestly yeah. it's we're grateful that our ringette friends brought us onto the ice to try it. It's a totally yeah. different sport. And Absolutely. I love the speed of it. It's just, it's it's a flow, yeah. right? It's really cool how it's Very always much moving. So. You're not standing on a line waiting for something you're moving. Yeah. Along. And that's something that through research that Ringette Alberta did uh, specifically uh, that kids were looking for is to be involved. Everyone on the ice is involved at all times. And they are. Um, and, and we're finding that we have... Um, uh, less attrition in the past few years like we're, we're seeing less girls leave in, in the older ages and we're also That's seeing great. a huge growth spurt in our adult leagues so we know we're doing something right we, we know that the, the sport is developing well um, the community the sense of community Emily can speak to this we've had some tragedies in, in the community uh, and the way that these teams and uh, parents and players rally mm -hmm. is like nothing I've ever seen, nothing I've ever experienced. And it really is a, a unique feeling um, that I think is driven because we are females yeah. and, and and we generally are a, a little bit more in tune okay. Um, okay. In, in those ways. So yeah, love it, love yeah. it. Can't say enough about it. And because it's niche, I think too. We can, we take a certain pride in people who, who know yeah. Ringette because it's so niche and understand True. Ringette. And we feel good about that because we're like, wow, not a lot of people have seen us. We've never been on actual TV. Um, if you've yes. seen it, you might have a cousin who played once and you walked into a rink and someone was playing ringette. Um, so if you know the community, it's it's very tight because I think, A, because it's mostly women, but B, because we band together okay. in our uniqueness. That's so beautiful. Yeah. I love that. Um, so, Emily, um, sport um, was kind of like ringette was the starting point of a big reason why you said you started this podcast, right? Because you wanted to, I mean, open up a space to have conversations, but not only about sport, um, 
which is why, I mean, I think your podcast also does a really good job at including everyone. So I can be the first to say that I'm not a sport person. I love sports. I love active living. Um, and I grew up playing sports, but it was not something I continued to pursue. But still, I love your podcast and I can relate. And I've listened to a couple episodes and um, you do a really good job at um, just practicing inclusion, like welcoming a space to have conversations about difficult things. So I love that, you know, sport was your starting point to kind of, to pave the way to this, to, to making space for conversation about things. And you're really passionate about, you mentioned equality, um, which can you just quickly touch on the, the title of your podcast? Even sport, even strength, even sport, even strength. Can you just touch a little on that? And where it came from? Yes. So for those that don't know, um, Even Strength, the name of my podcast, is also kind of a, a nod to um, sports in general. It's like a little a little term you, you use in a lot of uh, team sports. So it, it's kind of like a pun. Um, so if you have a team for ringette example, uh, five on five, so you have five players on the ice versus five players on the ice with two goalies. If somebody gets a penalty and you're four on five, then once that person returns and you're back to five on five, you're playing at even strength. Nice. So it's a bit of a, uh, an equality nod, but also yeah. a nod to the fact that it's, it's a sports focused. Uh, I love that. So, I love it so much. Very clever. Um, so can you also touch a little on um, what it means to, you know, to frame, like framing inclusion with intention and openness. You've mentioned that before. Um, while also touching on like equality and your heart behind that? So when I created this podcast, I knew that I needed to use my voice for other people. Um, I started it with the idea of having the people in my network help me get it off the ground, which was fantastic. But I wanted to do that with, you said intention, and I like to use the word intention because it, it is, exactly what I try to do. So um, we know that 4% of traditional media uh, covers women's sports, um, but then we look at that and say, okay, well, what, what is the 4%? Is it just cis white women? Mm -hmm. Pretty much. So for me, I think with, with my podcast, each episode features a different sports or aspect of sports, um, but I try to choose someone who was not necessarily represented in those communities in a way that they can see themselves. Um, so I have had, um, one of my, one of my favorite episodes, I had, uh, women's football with Olivia Gauchelaby and she is a fantastic, uh, person in general. She's doing her neuroscience PhD. She's, um, rocking the world of women's football. She's really high up in the ranks and really trailblazing, but part of her experience is being a black woman. Mm -hmm. So I want people to understand that, you know, the equality doesn't just have to exist within sports it has to exist within all of these complexities and that's what we call intersectionality yeah. so for me um even talking with my podcast i like to have an interview but also have a script for myself to come in and talk and discuss um i've had a, a couple episodes where we talk about the fluidity of gender um how gender is a spectrum um and how the medical community um hasn't acknowledged that for a very long time mm -hmm. um and we talk about one of the in my episodes uh sports inclusivity and about LGBTQ plus uh, individuals and how they experience sport, um, coming out stories and uh, passive aggressiveness and straight up rules against your, your ability to exist in a space. So I love that people can listen to my podcast and hear the stories of the people that I'm interviewing, but I also make sure that I am being open with the the truth of the matter so so making sure that people understand that there are other issues going on and that these are things to be aware of and that you can make small changes in your communities or in your lives to help improve the lives of others around you so that's that's basically um if i were to give a boiled down version of how i try and find people for my podcast it would be to to look for someone within a space but someone who could speak to a little bit more than just that sport absolutely amazing yeah that is amazing that's awesome and Judy, what are your what are your thoughts around like have you had any big aha moments around kind of inclusion and equity over you know the last few years? I know it's um, 
it's often easier to say, oh, yes, we believe in equality and inclusion, mm-hmm. but to actually go out and, and do it yeah. and, to, and mm-hmm. to put it to practice. Like, any yeah. big aha moments for you over the last few years around that, especially as an administrator in, in the world of yeah. uh, sport? Well, um, I mean, there isn't really a big aha moment, but like I said, the, uh, the sport world has evolved tremendously since I became involved at an, a young age. Um, but I find that Emily's podcast episodes have really shown me that there is a common struggle across female sport um, where we're all struggling to be recognized as legitimate or good enough. And um, I think there needs to be less emphasis on comparison. You know, you know like mm-hmm. uh, women's hockey is not as fast as men's I hockey, agree. for example. And instead, yeah. we need to embrace the uniqueness mm-hmm. and the talent of these athletes in their own right. And, uh, and really, uh, instead of focusing on what we don't have, is, is celebrating the traction that we have gained mm-hmm. and, and moving forward in that space. Um, and like Emily said, in a very inclusive way, because we do the best we can with what we know, but we know better now. And that's something that we really should be moving forward with. And like I said, not just do things because we've always done it that way, which is the easy thing to do because Mm -hmm. the majority of sports administration, especially minor sports is volunteer based and we're all busy and we all have families and jobs and other things that, you know, we'd probably rather be doing than looking at a in- inclusivity policy that is um, um, groundbreaking and probably um, kind of controversial in your particular sport for that moment mm-hmm. because it's never been addressed before. Yeah. So I think we have a real responsibility as administrators to delve into that uncomfortableness yeah. and work together to, to move it forward. So I love what you said around, you know, you know, celebrating versus comparing. And, and in mm-hmm. my eyes, even deeper than that is, you know, it's not, it di- shouldn't need to be men versus women. Like we exactly. have different Absolutely. sports and we play differently and it's fun to watch both. Um, but then the other piece too is even within our own women's world of sport mm-hmm. to stop comparing sports, you know, it shouldn't mm-hmm. be hockey versus ringette. I mean, we play ringette yes. because we have, I'm a hockey player because we've had ringette people on our team. So I got to experience the joy of both, right? We should yeah. be really working together to celebrate each other, you know, regardless of our cultures or beliefs or physical abilities, whatever yeah. that may look like. But the more we can celebrate each other, the bigger our pie gets and the more we can lift each other up and, and make an impact on this world, right? Yeah. Absolutely. I think we often underestimate just the small changes, right? I. I know I I can be one for that where it's like it's so small but we just we don't end up doing it because we don't think it'll make a difference or we don't think it'll have an impact but something small even within our group or our our circle or our community can make a difference and have a ripple effect which we've seen with so many other things in history so it's funny that we forget that you know so yeah I love this is such a great conversation and I love that um you know we have a kind of a cross-generational view that is um cohesive and collective because i mean we just we all just want to make a difference in this world and Mm -hmm. we're super grateful that you ladies have been able to join us Um, before we end this podcast we want to ask you a question that we've asked many of our guests over the over the last year in this crazy world of pandemic life um, so we're going to give you each a minute to tell us, uh, inspire us with what you are doing to keep yourselves moving and, um, you know, whether it's from a, you know, self care standpoint or, you know, just a physical activity standpoint during this, this time of COVID. We have, we happen to have lockdown here in Ontario right now. Yeah. I don't know what that looks like for you, Judy, in, in Calgary. Are you guys experiencing similar well, we're not Environment. nearly as tightly locked down as you, um, although we yeah. are reverting back to the previous uh, state on Friday. So yeah, we're pretty, we'll be pretty locked down by then. We'll be pretty locked yeah. down. Okay, so our yeah. world is is a, a bit crazy right now, and it, we, we feel it's really important that we continue to keep our bodies and our, our brains and our souls nourished. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so we'd like to ask you what you're doing uh, during this crazy time to keep, your, keep yourself uh, healthy. 
I mean, we'll start with you, Emily. So Tina, to answer your question, I actually moved from Calgary to Mississauga about three months ago. So finding um, things to do in a new city was the biggest push for me to still stay active. So on weekends, I'll go on the All Tra Trails app and look up uh, a good walking place, drive over there and do like three hours of walking around and exploring my community. Um, I think walking has been a, a big part of just getting to know the city, even though it's locked down um, and I don't know anybody specifically in the city, but I can still experience um, nature and walk around on the trails. And even though I don't have mountains anymore, I can still appreciate what I do have. So. Well, Ontario does have hills and we do have lakes. In fact, we have 2,500 lakes. <laughs> yes. So there are many That's lakes true. that you can hike around. Um, and if you're on um, all trails, it's my favorite app, honestly, to go out and just hike through. Um, Milton has some beautiful um, trails like Rattlesnake Point and um, Hilton, Hilton Hills, I think um that are not too far from you either so and you can always come over to york well we're not supposed to be going to other regions right now so i'm not going to say come over to york region right <laughs> now, but within uh, mississauga alone there's a uh, beautiful there are um, beautiful trails out That's there yeah. awesome how about you judy uh well uh, it's tough in the winter I, I mean ontario experience is the same it's tough to get outside but when the weather's nice i'm a big uh, cyclist uh, doing a lot of walking we're allowed to be outside with 10 people so you know reconnecting during COVID has been important so I've been doing a lot of walking like Emily but um, really kind of a silver lining for me in in the pandemic has been a kind of a kindling of my love for yoga mm -hmm. and uh, I, my studio has been doing the zoom classes so every day I'm in my yoga classes and and uh, really noticed a big difference in um, my practice mm -hmm. and loving it so yeah that's been a really uh, kind of a blessing for me that's awesome. And all of those are activities are mind, body, soul regenerating. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Amazing. Well, awesome. Thank you, ladies, for sharing your time with us today. Yeah. Um, honestly, it's uh, it's been a real pleasure, and uh, we're thrilled to see um, the impact that you guys are making uh, in the world, uh, making it definitely a kinder, more inclusive place, and really just chatting about what we can all do to support each other. Yeah. So perfect topic for this crazy pandemic time and or any time in our world, really, but even more so now. <laughs> so thank you all for uh, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, ladies. Great to be here. Okay, have a great one.